Good day, it's Tony Fortunato from the Technology Firm. Today we're going to talk about starting a dependency analysis. And this is something that uh, I've been putting off for a while, but more and more people are asking me for this. So, hey, let's put something together. Now, a little background information. So the applications are becoming more and more complicated. Now, this is, this is an interesting point because I get asked this quite a bit. The application doesn't have to be that complicated for you to do a dependency analysis. You'll see in this example, I use a very straightforward little example that you could even do at home, but it could really get out of control pretty quick, right? Uh, the second thing is the introduction of the cloud and local cloud hybrid systems aren't making things any easier. So there's a lot of places, corporations, you know, you've got data in the cloud, application local, that sort of thing, those hybrid solutions. And when you have that, the dependency analysis becomes very important. So you can understand how it works and how to troubleshoot it and how to better design your network. So for years, I've been showing people the value of a dependency analysis. The concept's pretty straightforward. Just document how your applications work. Literally, that's it. I'm going to I'm going to illustrate that very clearly in this presentation. I like to define and create different types of dependency documents, but the most common ones I use is the dependency analysis on the client side, which is what this one is. I'll explain what that is a little bit later. That documents which devices the client interacts with to complete a task. So every step along the way involves various network components and paths which can delay or lose your packets. And then there's a dependency analysis diagram format and that I'm going to show you that one in this example. And that visually documents the relationship between the devices in various levels of detail. Now you've probably inadvertently done a lot of these already, right? You'll, you'll see how, how straightforward these are to start. And then we've got a dependency analysis with response time measurements, and I've included that with this example as well. Um, and that's the other thing about dependency analysis or any kind of baseline documentation. It can really evolve, and anything you do is basically correct if you document how you did it. And that documents how long it takes each device to respond to the client. So as you guess, there's many variations on the same theme. And the purpose is to introduce you to the various concepts and techniques so you can perform your own analysis, right? So we're going to just basically start with a local web access example. So we're going to access a web server, techfirm.com, using Google's Chrome web browser and your Wi-Fi connected laptop. The domain name needs to be translated, so that's a step, right, by the DNS server. And then when you get that back, your browser may be configured, in this case, is configured to use a proxy, which has a name as well. So now we have to resolve that. In this case, that's with Active Directory. So we have DNS, we have Active Directory. So you can kind of guess what I'm what I'm doing here, right? Then the proxy server directs you to the firewall, and then that sends you out to the internet. So there I am, I'm the client. I go through wireless access point, and even that has a dependency analysis. How do you authenticate, right? All that good stuff. That's connected to a switch, and that's connected to a core router or another switch. There's our proxy, our DNS, and our Active Directory. All of these things, right, have to be in place to make things work. Now, the key here with a dependency analysis, I'm not trying to prove how things break, because that's easy. I'm trying to prove what could cause delay, right? So if one of these things slows down, the whole thing seems slow, right? That's pretty well what I'm trying to get at. So a logical diagram, it's pretty simple. So there's, there's me. And you can put as much detail in here as you want. Port, VLAN information, IP. Yeah, knock yourself out as much as you want. So I put here my, I'm using an Alienware, and I've got Windows 8.1. I'm using Chrome, and I'm accessing the techfirm.com, right? So you can be as detailed as you want. That may even have a notation like number one, which has a totally different document explaining it in tremendous detail. But we don't want to do that right now. This is good enough. And we can see the first thing we do is our DNS lookup. Where are we going? Google's public DNS, for example, doesn't have to be, but I just put it in there as an example, primary and secondary. And then, as I said earlier, you have to use a proxy, and the proxy is configured with a name, so you have to obviously resolve the name. In this case, the proxy server's Eddie, so you have to resolve Eddie. Then you have to traverse the firewall, and then go across the carrier link, and then off you go to the techfirm.com. That's it. That's as basic as you can start, right? From that, we can add some response times. So a DNS lookup, for example, took 22 milliseconds. The LDAP name resolution took two milliseconds. Traversing the firewall took five milliseconds. Then we have our carrier link, and then of course the techfirm.com, and then by the time that comes back, total time was 35 milliseconds. So at a quick glance here, you can see, well, you know, where are the biggest sources of latency? Obviously DNS, and obviously the server's down here. Well, we can't do much about the server, but maybe 
we can try to have a local DNS or a proxy DNS or a DNS forwarder and that would cut that time down tremendously right now the other thing that's important is you, you want to provide a list of all the servers and IP addresses that you are accessing for your dependency analysis. And you can get that through various ways. Netstat is a popular way to do it. You can capture a bunch of packets, another way to do it. Or you can use, like in this case, Chrome's development tool. It's literally F12 on the keyboard. Internet Explorer has the same thing, right? And you can actually see how long things are taking. There's the time. There's what you're actually doing and, you know, the status and all that good stuff. So that actually helps... Um, document the application as well. If you decide the capture packets, well now we're talking things like Wireshark, right? And I'll show you in Wireshark when you capture all your packets, what do you do? Well, when you capture them, in most cases I strongly suggest you do not use a capture filter because you don't know if it's IP version 6, IP version 4, you don't, you don't know for sure, so you should probably just leave it wide open. That means afterwards you need a display filter. The best way to do that, statistics, endpoint report, find your MAC address, right click, apply as filter and select it, or if you're comfortable enough, just type the following syntax in the display filter bar. Now, when you do that, you'll get a displayed output. But if you decide to use reports like the endpoint report, make sure you click this limit to display filter to only get the stuff that you were doing, right? Not everything, just your stuff. That's one way to deal with it afterwards. The other way to deal with it, what I prefer to do, is to just save the trace file filtered, right? So I have my original trace file, HTTP, well I'll save this one as HTTP filtered. So when you go to File, Export Specified Packets, make sure Displayed is checked off, it is by default, but just eyeball it, make sure it's there, and then give it a new name like Filtered. And now I've got a filtered trace file, which I can open and do a lot more specific things without having to worry about that display filter. The other thing we can do, we go to the I.O. graph. And you can actually set up all the protocols and see where they come in during the process. That's also very helpful to have, right? So I'm just kind of throwing all these different ideas at you. And then out of all of them, one or two will stick. With the I.O. graph, the default is packets, but you might want to use bytes or bits. And the packets per second, I always use to visualize things like audio, video type of output to make sure it's fairly consistent. That's if you're using uh, some kind of non-variable bit rate and you'll see that it's fairly static, right? If you're gonna use bytes, bytes is great to document how much data is being generated, like a database query, stuff like that. And then bits is great to represent network load. We're network people, we wanna know 10 megabits, one megabit, 50 megabits, that sort of thing. And that's a good way of displaying that as well. Now, when it gets to response time, well, you can just filter things out like DNS and you'll see your query and your response. You can use these transaction IDs here to make sure they're the same and then you'll see that's 86 milliseconds. Well, I've already done another video talking about transsum, which is now included with Wireshark. You can simply enable it, and that will tell you the response time as well. Well, if I add that as a column, just right click, apply as column, now I'll quickly see all of those response times on my actual packet list, right? So that saves me a ton of time. I can also go and use the uh, round trip time chart which I think is kind of helpful statistics TCP stream and then round trip time and that shows me the round trip time for TCP and in this case you can see there's my download one and my download two and you can see the peaks the maximums and you can see down here pretty well the averages right it gives you a really good graphical representation of that kind of stuff so at the end of all of this you might want to produce a little report so in this case DNS the average response time was 77 milliseconds the LDAP was 22 the proxy was two, so on and so on and so on. Now average, right? So for me, average means at least five measurements, drop the low, drop the high, average three. This whole process will take you less than, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes if you're fairly comfortable with what you're doing. In some cases, it's like five minutes, not a big deal. Um, so this, this whole process doesn't have to take binders of information. It doesn't need to take weeks of information. And it can be as involved as you want. But I strongly encourage you, just in closing, to take things one step at a time. Do little tiny pieces, little applications, little parts of the application, like the query, right, or the print, or the data entry, or the whatever. Like, break it into tasks if you have to, just so it's manageable. Don't try to attack this um, full sweep because you'll find they'll get over your head pretty damn quick. So there you go. That's how you start an application dependency analysis. 
I'm going to uh, do more videos on specifics on how to do things and more examples on how to do this. And that way you'll see more examples in the future. So have a good day. Bye for now.